Hello, and welcome back to Chapter 12. Today we're going to look at Section 12.2, which deals with techniques for evaluating limits. Back in Section 12.1, we looked at um, ways to evaluate limits, and one of the ways that we dealt with evaluating limits was with direct substitution. Now, in 12.2, direct substitution is not going to be a successful route, and this is why. If you look at this example below, um, right here, we have the limit as x approaches a negative 3 of the function x squared plus x minus 6 divided by x plus 3. Well, if I go ahead and I plug in a negative 3, I end up with a negative 3 squared, which is 9, plus a negative 3 minus 6 divided by a negative 3 plus 3. So if we go ahead and simplify that, 9 plus a negative 3 minus 6 gives me 0, divided by negative 3 plus 3 is also 0. Now when you get 0 divided by 0, this is what we call the indeterminate form. And what the indeterminate form is, is it's the 0 divided by 0. And if, and if nothing else, anything divided by 0 is undefined, so we can't take the limit of this function as it stands. Now I'll show you how we'll take the limit here in just one second. So example one says to find the limit of the function that we just looked at, which is x squared plus x minus 6 divided by the quantity of x plus 3, and we're taking the limit as x is approaching a negative 3. Now I know that when I plug in negative 3 for my x, or I do my direct substitution, I get the indeterminate form 0 divided by 0. So what I can do instead is I can go ahead and factor first. Okay, so when I factor this, I'm really taking the limit as x is approaching a negative 3, and my numerator is going to factor into x plus 3 times x minus 2. That should be a plus there. And I'm going to divide that by x plus 3. So what you'll see is going to happen is the x plus 3 in the numerator and denominator are going to cancel, and that's going to leave me with the limit as x approaches a negative 3 of the function x minus 2. So now when I go to do my direct substitution, I end up with a negative 3 minus 2 which gives me a negative 5. And this would be my final answer. And if you were to graph and either use a table or the graph itself, you would see that your limit is approaching a negative 5 from both the left and the right direction. Example 2 then says to find the limit of x minus 2 divided by the function x cubed minus 2x squared plus 2x minus 4. Well, if we go ahead and we plug a 2 in for both the numerator and the denominator, that's going to give me 0 divided by 2 cubed is 8 minus 2 times 2 squared, or 4. That's going to give me 0 because now I have 8 minus 0. And then I have plus 2 times 2 is 4, but I'm going to subtract another 4, so that will give me 0 as well. So I have the indeterminate form. Anytime I have the indeterminate form, that tells me that I have to do something else to simplify this. And 0 divided by 0 is different than getting something like 0 divided by a number, which would then be a limit of 0. Okay, if I, anytime I get 0 divided by 0 or the indeterminate form, I have to take another action in order to take this limit. So as we discussed in example 1, we're going to factor. So when I factor, I see that I have the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 2, and if you group that, you're going to end up with x squared plus 2 times the quantity of x minus 2. So again, we're going to cancel out like pieces from the numerator and denominator, and we end up with the limit as x approaches 2 of 1 divided by x squared plus 2. 
So now when I do direct substitution, I end up with 1 divided by 2 squared, which is 4, plus 2, or I end up with 1 sixth, which would be my final answer, or the limit of this function. Now sometimes we're given problems where we have a radical involved. If we have a radical involved, we have to do um, what we call the rationalizing technique. And sometimes that means to, that we have to rationalize the numerator. So let's go ahead and look at our next example, which is example 3. And here it says to find the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x plus 9 minus 3, and we're going to divide that by x. And again, we're going to try direct substitution, which in this case, 0 plus 9 is going to give me 9. If I take the square root of 9, it gives me 3, and 3 minus 3 is 0. And if I plug a 0 in for x, I get 0. 0 divided by 0 is the indeterminate form, which tells me I have to do something else to simplify this. So, to rationalize the numerator, I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x plus 9 minus 3 divided by x. And it's just like rationalizing a denominator, except I'm going to multiply um, the numerator and denominator by the... It's kind of like the complex conjugate when we're dealing with complex numbers, but this time I'm going to multiply it by the square root of x plus 9 plus 3. And I'm going to divide that by the same thing. So the square root of x plus 9 plus 3. So what happens then is when I multiply the square root of x plus 9 times the square root of x plus 9, we end up with x plus 9. And because I'm multiplying two binomials that are the same but are separated by the addition and subtraction, I know my middle term will cancel and then I'm going to have the minus 9 outside. And then for my denominator, what I have is x times the quantity of the square root of x plus 9 plus 3. So what we end up with then is the limit as x approaches 0 of x divided by x times the quantity of the square root of x plus 9 plus 3. And because I have an x in my numerator and x is a product of my denominator, I can cancel my x's, which then leaves me with the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 divided by the square root of x plus 9 plus 3. I can't simplify this anymore, so now I'm going to go ahead and try my direct substitution. And when I do that, we end up with 1 divided by 0 plus 9 is going to give me 9. The square root of 9 is 3 plus 3, so this gives me 1 sixth as the limit. Another topic we have to look at when dealing with limits are what we call one-sided limits. Now, we've kind of talked about this a little bit in class, but a one-sided limit is when a function approaches a different value from the left than it, dis than it does from the right. And we can show this as, um, if we look at this formula right here, it says the limit as x approaches c, and this little negative sign means from the left. So if the negative is on the right-hand side, we say the limit as x approaches c from the left of my function f of x equals l sub 1. Likewise, if we look down here, we have the limit as x approaches c from the right, because of the plus sign, of f of x equals your um, second limit, or l sub 2. So, for example 4, it says we want to find the limit as x approaches 0 from the left, of the absolute value of x divided by 4x, and we want to find the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of the absolute value of x divided by 4x. Uh, I think the best way to do this is to go ahead and graph this on your calculator, so you may want to pause the video for a second, graph it on your calculator, and what you'll see is, is when we evaluate the limit 
as x approaches 0 from the left of the absolute value of x divided by 4x, we get a negative 1 fourth, and the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of the absolute value of x divided by 4x, this will actually give us a positive 1 fourth. And again, please double check this on your graph or your table. And one last thing, and we've again, we've already kind of talked about this, but we need to reiterate the fact that the limit as x approaches c of f of x will equal the limit L if and only if both the left and right limits exist, okay, that's the first piece, and they have to be equal to L. So if your left limit does not equal the right limit, the limit as a whole does not exist. The left limit has to equal the right limit in order for your limit to exist at all. So example 5 says to find the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x. And it tells us that f of x equals x squared plus 1 when x is less than 2 and a negative 1 half x plus 6 when x is greater than 2. So the first thing I would do is I would graph this. So to find out if this limit exists, we're going to take the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x, and we're going to evaluate it. So as I come in from the left, this is when my x values are less than 2. So as we follow this curve around, and as x is approaching 2 from the left, I see that my function is actually approaching 5. Now likewise, when I take the limit as x approaches 2 from the right, of f of x, I'm going to be coming in from the right in this direction and I see that my y values are also approaching 5 because this tick mark here is 5. Now even though I have an open circle on the coordinate point 2, 5, my limit from the left and the right is still approaching 5 so now I can say or justify that the limit as x approaches 2, 1 it exists and 2 that limit is equal to 5. And our last example says, for the function f of x equals 2x squared plus 1, we want to find the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 all divided by h. Now, if you plug in a 0, you will see that you end up with a 0 divided by 0. We can't have that. That's our indeterminate form. This format right here should also look familiar. This is called your difference quotient, which we did back at the beginning of the school year. This is coming back, and this is actually the definition of a limit. So if we want to take the limit of this, we're going to take the limit as h approaches 0 of, remember that this f of 2 plus h means to evaluate my function, which is right here, at 2 plus h. So I'm going to plug a 2 plus h in for every x. So I end up with 2 times the quantity of 2 plus h squared plus 1. So that's the f of 2 plus h. Now I'm going to subtract. It says f of 2. So I'm going to take my function here and evaluate it when x is 2. So to do that, we end up with 2 times 2 squared plus 1, and I'm going to divide this whole thing by h. So now when I simplify this, I know that 2 plus h squared, and I'm just going to write this above, is really 4 plus 4h plus h squared, and I have to multiply everything by 2. And I might as well simplify the second piece here, 2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8 plus 1, so this whole thing equals 9. So when I simplify, I now have the limit as h approaches 0, and yes, you do have to rewrite that, of 8 plus 8h plus 2h squared plus 1 minus, oops, plus 1 minus 9, and I'm going to divide the whole thing 
by h. So when I go ahead and simplify everything now, I have an 8 and a 1 and a 9, which are going to cancel, and I'm left with the limit as h approaches 0, and yes, you have to write that again, of 8h plus 2h squared divided by h. I still can't plug a 0 in because I'm going to end up with the indeterminate form of 0 divided by 0, but I can go ahead and factor an h out of my numerator. So when I do that, I get the limit as h approaches 0 of h times 8 plus 2h divided by h. I see that the h's here are going to cancel, and that's going to leave me with the limit as h approaches 0 of 8 plus 2h. Now when I go to do my direct substitution, I can plug a 0 in for h, and I see that I end up with 8. And this is what my limit is when I use the difference quotient. And that concludes our video tonight. I will have a fun fact posted later in the evening. Have a good night.